most research on violent extremism focuses on why it happens. However, even in areas hit hard by radicalization and violent extremism, such as in Syria, Iraq and the Sahel area, where most, in particular young people, have numerous reasons to be angry, only a small minority actually joins violent extremism groups. So, how can this be explained? The newly-led EU project Prevex tries to answer this question by taking a particular look at why people in so-called enabling environments do not become radicalized. The project is now in its third and final year, and interesting research findings have started to show themselves, proving that the assumption we might have on radicalization in areas like the Balkans and the broader MENA region aren't necessarily as we tend to think it is. You're listening to the podcast The World Stage. My name is Marie Furhaften, and I have today invited three central researchers in the Prevex project to tell me more about this topic. We have uh, Diana Mishkova, uh, professor at the Center for Advanced Studies, Sofia, who's leading the work in the Balkans. Welcome, Diana. And then we have Luca Ranieri, assistant professor at St. Anna School of Advanced Studies, who's been working on the North Africa and in the Sahel. Hello to you. Hello. Uh, and last but not least, we have Stéphane Lacroix, associate professor at Sciences Po, uh, who's leading the work on the Middle East part of the project. Welcome. Hi. You have all been doing research in your respective areas in so-called enabling environments. And these hold very different types of countries in terms of level of stability, culture, religion, etc. Uh, so first of all, what makes these three areas so interesting when looking at radicalization and violent extremism and uh, resilience? Diana, maybe we should start with the Balkans. Yeah. Uh, well, the most interesting aspects will come out of, uh, from the comparison that we are aiming at at the very end of, the, of this project. But uh, as a start, let me say that um, from, uh, in the, in the, against the backdrop of the Prevex uh, uh, conceptual framework, what makes the Balkans interesting is the uh, intricate, complex um, interplay between um, uh, religious-based or... Uh, um, ideological uh, violent extremism, uh, Islamic extremism in particular, and ethno-national extremism. Now, in the Balkan, in the Western Balkan region, we are actually talking of five case studies, five countries, uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina, Albania, Serbia, North Macedonia, and Kosovo. And what brings this countries together, even with, in a different ratio, is the, the mixed <coughs> religious and ethnic and ethnic character. Uh, in the case of Kosovo, Albania and Bosnia-Herzegovina, we are talking of uh, majorities of Muslim population with some enclaves of Catholic and Greek Orthodox populations and other. Well, in the case of Serbia and North Macedonia, we're talking of majority of uh, uh, Greek Orthodox and uh, enclaves uh, and, and uh, pockets of uh, certain regions uh, where Muslims and Christians live, uh, live together. So it is, on the one hand, the coexistence, and on the other hand, the uh, mutual entanglement of this kind of, of different radicalizations that make the Balkans an interesting case, uh, uh, an interesting region to, to look into from the point of view of the uh, Prevex agenda. Hmm. And uh, what about the Middle East, uh, Stefan? Well, the Middle East that we, we look at, so we've been mostly looking at four countries in the project, although we have things to say about most of them, most of the countries of the region, but there's four that have been particularly featured, which are uh, Egypt and uh, Jordan and Syria and Iraq. Of course, those are very different countries um, because Syria and Iraq have been going through um, a civil war that's been going on for several years. I mean, in the case of Iraq, it's probably almost 20 by now. Uh, in Syria, it's more recent. But those two countries, of course, are similar in the sense that the state is very weak. You have a lot of areas that escape the control of the state. You've historically had um, a proliferation of um, armed groups. Um, Egypt and Jordan are different because then you have, there you have a state which is at least pretends to be pretty strong in the middle and 
very repressive in the case of Egypt. And so those are sufficiently different cases so that actually they are interesting in the comparison, right, among themselves, because what comes out of them, I mean, for a researcher, basically, it's always interesting to look at different things that bring comparable results so that you can actually, you know, uh, make conclusions out of that. Um, and, and in all of these areas, we have, uh, uh, you know, occurrence and non-occurrence. And, and the question of non-occurrence has been very central in, in the project. And non-occurrence happens sometimes where you don't expect it, right? I mean, um, Egypt was particularly interesting in that respect because in the wake of the military coup of 2013, um, many imagined that uh, the country would uh, descend into civil war because there was a, a big political party, the Muslim Brotherhood, that had... Uh, been elected to the government that had run the country for a year that was being ousted by a military coup. And people compared the situation to Algeria in the 90s when, when, when the uh, Islamist party, the Fees, was ousted by the military and Algeria descended into civil war and that lasted for most of the 90s. This did not happen in Egypt. And so one of the key questions was why? Uh, so those are some of the things that we look at. And of course, in Syria and Iraq, it's a different situation, although even in Syria and Iraq, again, certain regions were more prone to uh, the formation of jihadi groups, certain communities. And so what we're interested in is trying to compare all these different things and, and understand what the patterns are. Mm. It's very interesting also because for, for a non-expert, you would think uh, that, that has been made this sort of um, uh, regions that they must have some, so much in common. But as you both saying, you know, all these countries, are, they are so different. Uh, even in this region, so absolutely, I think that's absolutely. Even even the the, the 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 timing of the inception as political uh, state political units is is different. I mean, Kosovo being the youngest, prior to that it was Bosnia and Herzegovina, which did not exist as a state unit at all, and put next to more traditional states like Serbia, Albania. By the way, North Macedonia is also a new creation. So, so it, it it tells also a lot about the dynamics of of these of these societies and the different different uh, local global connections in their in their radicalization. But probably we'll talk about this a little bit later. Yeah, yeah. because first I, I want to hear from you, Luca, on uh, on North Africa and in the Sahel. What's interesting about these areas? Yeah, definitely, and I think that the same diversity applies to this region. In fact. The fact of considering these two areas as part of the same region is not to be given for granted at all. Uh, traditionally, uh, sub-Saharan Africa has been considered something completely different from North Africa, and indeed um, social and economic patterns are very uh, different in these two areas. However, there are also uh, connections that are very important, particularly when speaking of, um, of issues that have to do with violent extremism. The six countries we are looking at are particularly relevant for the analysis of this phenomena for a variety of reasons. Um, take the cases of Tunisia and Morocco, which could be considered as some of the most stable countries in the region, although they went through different processes uh, in the um, period of the Arab Springs. Uh, well, these two countries are considered among the largest uh, providers of foreign fighters worldwide. Um, Libya is another very interesting case. Libya has played a pivotal role for the whole African continent for the spread of uh, jihadist networks such as Al-Qaeda as well as the Islamic State. There are now recent researchers that are demonstrating uh, that one can trace even the origin of the allegiance of what used to be called Boko Haram and is now part of the Islamic State. Well, this allegiance has been done through uh, Libyan connected networks. Um, Algeria is another very important case that was mentioned before because in the 90s it went through a civil war in which obviously uh, Islamism and violent extremism played a pivotal role. Not to mention the uh, Sahelian countries that we are analyzing, Mali and Niger, which are currently affected by uh, large-scale insurgencies which are partly also motivated or inspired by radical ideas or uh, jihadist ideologies. So this makes, these observations make of this area a very, very interesting environment to study violent extremism, but also, as mentioned, to study um, situations in which, in spite of all potential factors being there that would motivate people into joining uh, violent extremist groups, we don't see this happening. Uh, 
that is not only the case for the majority of the populations, but there are also specific regions which appear to be preserved from this phenomena. Take the case of the region of Agadez in the north of Niger, which is surrounded by hotbeds of jihadism all over the places and still appears to be quite a resilient region uh, in the face of this phenomenon. This is a very uh, interesting puzzle that we try to interrogate in our research. So the project still isn't finalized, I know, uh, but what are your most important findings so far? Can you say anything on on this topic? Maybe you can start, Stefan. Um, well, I mean, we've, we've, we're still working on this, but we have a, a number of ideas that we want to uh, insist on in the uh, in in the in the final papers that we'll present. Um, I mean, what we've seen is that uh, you know the, the, there's an interplay between the structural conditions that produce uh, um, uh, violent extremism. I mean, there's social, economic, political conditions that are uh, that create those those enabling environments in, in certain areas. Um, we've seen also that 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 ideology plays a role, and and the availability of ideology or the legitimacy of of ideological frames. So when people you know are angry or are made angry by certain conditions, then uh, they would be more prone to look for a, a vehicle to express that anger, and 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 that vehicle could be a jihadi ideology that would. For some reason, again, been seen in the re in in those communities as um, well as I said, available and 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 having some legitimacy. Uh, that means that uh, one thing that we've been looking at, which has been interesting to us, is uh, the question of of counter narratives or counter discourses, you know, and why certain states have been able or have been successful at presenting uh, counter uh, narratives or counter discourses to. Uh, jihadi ideology, and and that is that is that is a difficult thing to do because, um, you know, it's not simply as you have in many of the Middle East, the Middle Eastern countries, uh, state Islam, because state Islam usually is run by uh, clerics who are employees of the state and who are basically parrots of the state. You know, they they're being paid to say something, and the state tells them to say that jihadis are bad people, and they will say that jihadis are bad people, but no one takes them seriously, because everyone knows that they're being paid to say that. So the, 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 the whole thing is, is, is to have, you know, these scholars who are seen as credible, who are seen as legitimate, who are seen as having authority by the populations, who counter jihadism on its own ground. Um, and sometimes, you know, this has been, I mean, in the case of Jordan, uh, it's pretty extreme case, because Jordan, the, the Jordanian government has co-opted uh, certain leading jihadi ideologues, who are actually some of the main sources of inspiration of, of ISIS, for instance, who now are actually somehow working together with the Jordanian government to kind of set red lines to what acceptable jihadism could look like. Of course, these people are not de-radicalized, by the way, they're pretty radical still. But the Jordanian government has understood that by using them Again, because they speak to a constituency that precisely is the constituency that is that is uh, prone to radicalization. So, you know, if these people can convey certain messages, put certain red lines, and they can be useful to the purpose of the government. Um, in, in Egypt, we've also been, and I mentioned that before, we've also been interested in why the Muslim Brotherhood didn't um, didn't turn violent after 2013, or only small factions of the Brotherhood turned violent. And again, uh, there's been a, an internal debate where certain authority figures within the Brotherhood took a position against violence. And the fact that these figures had a lot of credibility within the organization, and they were some of the older guard within the organization, that actually played a role also in limiting uh, the appeal of, of violence for the younger members. Um, so those dynamics were particularly interesting to us. Uh, we've also been looking at other things. We've been interested in um, looking at communities, looking at the role of, um, you know, you know, for instance, in the case of Syria, uh, we've been looking at, um, you know, the tribal dimension. Uh, the, the the author that we that that worked with us on this, uh, uh, who is Syrian himself. Uh, and who comes from the region of Deir Ezzor, was interested in, in trying to understand why in the region of Deir Ezzor, certain tribes joined Jabhat al-Nusra, other tribes joined ISIS, and other tribes joined neither group. And he tries to explain why that particular tribe did what it did. And what is interesting is that this all goes back to tribal conflicts that existed before the rise of the Syrian civil war. 
And those conflicts were mostly for the control of resources. So certain tribes were out with each other because they were competing for the same resources. And so when the war started, one of the tribes adopted you know, ISIS or, you know, Nusra as a brand. And so the other tribe adopted the opposite brands, you know. So those ideological labels were really used as brands, you know, basically instrumentalized by the different tribes to, to continue what was essentially a tribal conflict with now a layer of ideology that was never so important in the end. There's also a tribe that actually did not uh, fall into any of those jihadi groups and that actually stayed on the sidelines. And it's also interesting to understand why it was traditionally a tribe that was settled in a, an area that was more prosperous, where people were more educated, uh, that kind of saw itself as above the other tribal groups and saw itself also as, you know, not uh, in need of more resources than what it had. So because it didn't have to compete for resources, it could also stay out of that dynamic. So I think that, that, that you know, that shows how all of this is very much connected to, uh, well, basically bread and butter issues, to, uh, uh, you know, resource competition issues. And I think that's some of the things we've been looking at in that yeah. uh, part of the project. So bread and butter issues, Sir Luca, is it the same that you've seen in North Africa and in, in the Sahel? Indeed, it, it does matter a lot uh, in this region too. Um, I think the starting point, however, is very interesting to, to uh, be aware of because uh, until no more than a decade ago, uh, both Mali and Niger, as well as Burkina Faso for what matters, uh, or Tunisia were all seen as countries in which uh, religion was not a political issue. Uh, tolerance was widespread and communities could live with one another in spite of the fact that uh, the large majority of the population is Muslim, but religion was not a politi politically charged matter. It has become so in the recent decades, in the recent decade, I would say, uh, as part of a, comp of a competition for the access to resources, no doubt. Uh, indeed, our uh, preliminary findings tend to indicate that uh, material factors do matter a lot in explaining why uh, some people end up by joining uh, jihadist, uh, jihadist groups. It's uh, the need for jobs, it's the need for access to natural resources, access to social services, feelings of marginalization vis-a-vis -vis the tribes that are dominating in specific countries or region. Um, even more importantly, uh, and I think this is a very interesting finding, is the fact that some tribes appear to be protected by the state and therefore used by the states and to a certain extent by their international partners in order to counter jihadism. They have been co-opted into counter-terrorism mechanisms. And this has triggered a mechanism whereby some tribes feel that they are left unprotected. And that is pushing those tribes in the hand of those who posture as the protectors of those tribes, and these are jihadist groups. So these dynamics are very, very important, and they tend to highlight that to a certain extent, even counter-terrorism policies that have been implemented, including with the sponsorship of international partners, including to a certain extent European states, have ended up fueling rather than curtailing uh, violent extremism. And this is one of the most troubling findings that is being confirmed by our, by our, by our research. Um, I would add one last factor, which I find quite important, uh, referring to what was mentioned before, which is the role of traditional leaders. Because we have observed that in those areas in which indeed we are noticing that in spite of the presence of all the factors that would contribute to people joining uh, violent extremist groups, uh, jihadism is not taking root. Why is it the case? Because we notice that local traditional leaders are playing a huge role in dissuading the youth from joining these groups. And this includes, quite interestingly, also traditional leaders that promote radical views on Islam uh, that could be labeled as radical Salafist leaders, but in spite of that are very far from preaching violence or from preaching, preaching uh, a violent contest against the state. So these actors have been uh, pivotal in uh, um, preventing the youth from accessing violent extremism. Mm. Do you see any sort of the same type of actors in the Balkans, Diana? I see b b similarities and differences here. Uh, but let me start one step behind. Um, 
uh, what I, uh, the lessons we learned are, are very closely related to this uh, to this framework that I was trying to to outline at the very beginning. This coexistence and entwinement of different kinds of radicalism, which have different, very often different origin and different trajectory. However, very often due to the meddling of political brokers or political political actors on the field, basically parties or, or interest groups and, and so on, um, become politicized and instrumentalized so as to engender ultimately uh, a violent extremist kind of, uh, of line, of, line of, of, uh, of behavior and radicalization uh, generally. Now, on the one hand, we have to bear in mind that in the Balkans, this actually does not refer only to the Balkans or Southeastern Europe. It refers also to Central Europe. These are states that had emerged relatively late uh, out of imperial networks, uh, sorry, uh, out of imperial frameworks, which means that uh, their modern history is intrinsically related with unsolved ethnic national issues. Now, the politicization of these issues is something which we would take as, as a logical first, first step, so to say. Religion, however, also had played a major part in this because national identity and religious identity in this, in this uh, part of Europe has been closely, closely entwined. This doesn't mean that the coexistence of religiously based and ethnic based radicalization necessarily would lead to violent extremism. But combined with the, uh, um, the emergence of these young and unstable democracies, with uh, uh, the congruence of, of political and economic protracted crisis, with dysfunctional states, and the tendency of local political actors to exploit the, these uh, religious and ethnic tensions to their ends necessarily creates uh, somewhat by default creates this kind of, of, of uh, um, uh, environment which is so um, uh, which, which, which creates the, the, the potential for, uh, for radicalization. Uh, at the same time, however, these two kind of radicalizations, Underwent different different trajectories since uh, the civil war in in, in Syria. Uh, in the in in the first place, I mean, we should we should bear in mind that that uh, jihadism was basically imported into this region, into the into the Western Balkans, and afterwards it was exported via foreign fighters, but locally it didn't find fertile, fertile soil. And this is also where I find certain, certain similarities. And the answer there then, however, might, the answers to this might, uh, might uh, differ. One answer which is very similar is the role of traditional le uh, leaders. And in the case of the Balkans, of the, uh, also of the traditional form of Sunni Islam, which is the heritage of the Ottoman Empire, which in turn means that it is a kind of Islam that had long been imbricated, sort of very, very, uh, 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 sort of domesticated in a, in a, in a sense together with, uh, with the local Christian, uh, Christian denominations. So uh, we, we can see a different trajectory in this, uh, in this sense that the one was important, the one was, was local on the one hand, and also the, the, the dynamics in, in this uh, local, local transnational uh, 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 interaction because uh, while, while the, the religious base, the Islamic extremism was basically engendered out of transnational interaction of, of global, uh, uh, we may say global Islamic mobilization, the ethno-national radicalism was ultimately the outcome of domestic or regional uh, 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 tensions, problems, and networks as well because Serbian and Bosnian uh, ethno-nationalists Operate very often closely, closely uh, with with each other, whilst the, the the jihadists, so to say, are are more. I mean, they they operate outside the region, but in a global in global networks. Mm. There is a lot <laughs> to talk about <laughs> sure. on this topic, and uh, we could make an episode on each country, I guess. Um, but uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna stop there. But before we um, finish off for today, I wanted to bring in uh, Stephen Blockmans. You are the uh, director of research at CEPS, Center for European Policy Studies in Brussels. 
and do you lead the work uh, with how the EU is handling the prevention of violent extremism in the region we've talked about today? You lead the work on this in the Prevex project. So um, based on what you've heard here today, uh, what are the implications of what we've heard uh, for the EU's work on preventing violent, violent extremism? Well, they're multifold. <laughs> Obviously, you've, uh, you've heard very context-specific uh, findings, of course, being derived from the field research. I think um, taking one step back, one should realize that the European Union is not a unitary actor and is composed of 27 member states, many of whom have their own history in violent extremism, trying to prevent or counter it. And so what the project has done is to, first of all, look at those uh, lessons learned, practices which have evolved over time in uh, EU member states and how they've percolated upwards onto the supranational level of on which the European Union is active, both internally as well as externally. The second observation, I think, or caveat that one should uh, always keep in mind is that the EU as a supranational construct is only attributed the competences to act in certain fields where member states have allowed it uh, to happen. And in the field of uh, security, um, defense more generally, uh, military aspects where we see a certain securitization of um, the prevention and countering of um, violent extremism in, uh, in regions around the world and covered by the project, uh, Prevec project. We've seen the EU not being uh, very competent or equipped, well equipped uh, to act. And yet there is this interaction, therefore, uh, within the EU at different layers. Um, and the EU in the different regions in which the project has, um, has uh, investigated uh, PVE and uh, CVE. So just, just for the non-experts, PVE and CVE. The prevention of violent extremism or countering uh, violent extremism. The EU had established, of course, already policy frameworks in which uh, it had acted towards the Western Balkans, uh, countries that uh, aspire to EU membership. The EU has applied upgraded uh, development policies, in essence, which are premised on uh, heavy insistence on uh, democratization, uh, introdu introduction of good governance uh, methods, um, rule of law aspects, etc. And where PVE, CVE um, is folded into existing uh, policy networks or, or policy frameworks without uh, being necessarily offered the type of expression that it would get in other uh, theaters. And so if one compares that very uh, policy approach already from the Balkans with the two other regions that have been covered in the project, one realizes how vast uh, the differences are. And so um, where I think the comparative analysis uh, across the regions may really help the European Union is not just uh, to get a better understanding of um, what the local contexts have taught us about the best practices in order to uh, the, the, the inhibiting factors or, or actors or indeed facilitating actors of factors so as to address these root causes of violent extremism in particular, which are uh, to a large extent uh, socioeconomic uh, in nature. Um, and thus allow the European Union and its member states to uh, refine their um, actions um, and the implementation of their budgets uh, and instruments uh, geared towards a, a better understanding of what uh, ought to be done uh, in, in preventing countering uh, violent extremism. At the moment, it seems that because of attacks on the homeland uh, in France uh, most recently, there is, of course, a heavy insistence on uh, on securitization uh, in, in this approach, premised on the idea that religion is, uh, is a problem. But this, as the case studies have shown, is not necessarily the case. And uh, so I think in all modesty, um, what the findings of the project have revealed are relevant, I think, for the European Union uh, to refine their policy mix uh, in a context-specific 
uh, sense. And by applying a lens which has hitherto uh, not been used, which is that of PVE, CVE. Mm -hmm. And where the EU has, of course, implemented ample uh, instruments and, and projects uh, in the past, but not necessarily with the name of preventing or countering violent uh, extremism. And this is where I think the project can really add value. Mm. Well, that sounds very promising. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing all the results when uh, it's finalized uh, at the end of this project. I think we'll end there. So um, uh, thank you very much for participating. Uh, Stefan, Diane, Stephen and Luca. Thank you.